Thank you. So my name is Angela Carlin and I'm a lecturer in exercise and health at Ulster University. And today I'm going to be focusing on one target population, that is adolescent females, and are they heading towards a lifetime of ill health? And within this, I'll present some work from my PhD. Um, so at this point, I'd like to acknowledge the work of my co-investigators, Professor Alison Gallagher and Professor Marie Murphy. So why adolescent girls and why do we need to focus on this population? So I'm sure many of us in the room have seen headlines like this appearing in our media on a regular basis, highlighting the case for adolescent girls and why we really need to intervene in this age group. Adolescent girls represent an at-risk population for a number of risky health behaviours, for example, reduced physical activity. And we can see from the headlines presented here that not only does this have an impact on their physical health, but reduced physical activity at this stage of the life cycle can have an impact on other factors such as their self-esteem and their ability then to be active as they move into adulthood. So in terms then of the health benefits for physical activity, those aged between five and 18 years are currently recommended to take part in at least 60 minutes per day and up to several hours of moderate to vigorous physical activity. And within this as well, there are also recommendations in terms of time spent in muscle and bone strengthening activities on three days of the week. In addition, as Marie has highlighted in her previous presentation, there is a gen generic guideline to reduce time spent in sedentary behaviour, and we've seen from the previous slide the health risks associated with this. So by participating in that recommended level of physical activity, our young people can achieve a wide range of benefits <coughs> both in relation to their physical health and also their mental well-being. And within this then, the role um, of physical activity and obesity comes into play. So it's important to be mindful that yes, or physical activity will play a role in weight management in this population, and it's vital that we target both sides of the energy balance equation, but also to be mindful when we go forward now and look at some of the statistics that weight maintenance is just one of many benefits. So as well as being at risk for gaining weight as reduced or as a result of inactivity, they are also being exposed to a wide range of other health risks. So I'd now like to just present some data um, setting the scene on what the current levels of physical activity are in our population. So this was objectively measured physical activity data collected from the Millennium Cohort Study in a representative sample of seven-year-olds across the UK. And worryingly, what this study found was that across the UK, approximately half of our seven-year-olds were meeting the current physical activity guideline. And a stark um, point to take from this slide was the significant gender differences that occurred between our males and females, even at this young age, with girls significantly less likely to meet the guidelines compared to their male counterparts. And most worrying then, from a Northern Ireland perspective, was that children living here were least likely to meet the guidelines compared to their peers across the UK. So moving on then to look um, at statistics in those older children. So these are our adolescents aged between 11 and 16 years. And this is data that is routinely collected as part of the Northern Ireland Young Persons Behaviour and Attitude Survey. So worryingly, the latest round of the survey last year highlighted that just one in eight of our young people here were meeting the guideline for seven hours per day. And as we can see from the graph also, Again, significant gender differences were observed, with our girls least likely to meet the guidelines. What's also worth pointing out here is that as well as a decline in actual participation, the survey also measures enjoyment, and enjoyment in physical activity and sport participation was also shown to decline across adolescents, and this was driven mostly from a decline in females. And what's important from the perspective of Northern Ireland and collecting this within the Young Persons Behaviour and Attitude Survey, this survey is collected every three years and has shown positive trends in other health-related behaviours. So evidence has shown that our young people's, for example, use of um, alcohol, substance use and smoking behaviours are having a positive decline, but it's the sides of the energy balance equation, our physical activity and our dietary intake that are unfortunately going in the wrong direction. So looking then at a specific domain of physical activity, so this is active travel to school, and this is usually a focus of policies and interventions to try and promote physical activity in this age group. So these are recent findings collected as part of the Continuous Household Survey in Northern Ireland, 
and they demonstrate that just about a quarter of her primary school children and under a fifth of her post-primary school children currently engage in active travel to school. And when we think about some of her European counterparts, the rate of active travel can be as high as 50 or 60 per cent in those countries. So we can see that this is a worrying behaviour. What's also notable from this slide is the differences, particularly at post-primary level, in children from rural and urban environments, with those from a rural environment only having a rate of about 4 per cent of active travel compared to nearly a quarter of urban. So whilst we may think that encouraging active travel is an effective means, it may not necessarily be possible for all of our students and pupils, and therefore we may need to look at other opportunities across the school day to promote activity. So finally, this was data just recently published from the Office of National Statistics, and it hit the headlines here at the start of the year, showing where our young people tended to spend their time, okay, so in relation to leisure. And again, what we can take from this slide is the stark gender differences again, so if we look at sport, for example, again, our boys were reporting a much higher level of sport on a daily basis compared to girls. And it's just worth pointing out, with the um, exception of the Millennium Cohort Study, most of the data that we have to date is self-reported. So we have to be aware that these young people may actually be over-reporting their physical activity, and the actual statistics could be even more worrying than what we actually have. So moving on then to look, we obviously know that there's a strong case that we need to promote physical activity and other health-related behaviours in this population. But in order to do this effectively, we firstly need to understand the correlates of behaviour. So this was a review conducted recently looking at what influences physical activity in adolescent females. And you'll probably feel some of these are quite obvious, so in relation to enjoyment and self-efficacy. Also, physical self-perception, so how they felt taking part and their own perceived confidence played a role in being active. And also then, social support played a key role, coming from both family and also peers and friends. So building on from this work then, um, at Ulster we decided to undertake some exploratory research to try and discover what were the current influences on physical activity in adolescents here in Northern Ireland and how best could we promote physical activity. So we conducted a qualitative focus group study um, with young males and females across Northern Ireland and we identified a number of key influences on their current levels. These included, as identified in the previous slide, the influence of friends and family from a support point of view and also identified a number of barriers, for example, cost and access to resources. The age group that we um, interviewed, many had just recently made the transition from primary to post-primary education and many highlighted this shift and their changing priorities as something that had impacted on their ability to be active. And finally, this age group were very aware of the consequences of not being physically active. So we had many of our female respondents saying that they didn't want to gain weight or they didn't want to be unhealthy in later life. And that was what encouraged them to be active at this stage. So just to draw out on a few of those then and just provide you with an example of some of the quotes we received. So in relation to the influence of friends and family, these were shown to both indirectly influence physical activity in terms of providing support, but also from a direct influence in terms of actually being active with them. In terms of barriers then, and this is where we need to be mindful again, um, looking back at the active travel data and the disparities there between urban and rural, Many highlighted their actual access to sport and physical activity. So if clubs and facilities weren't easily accessible, the, the resources or getting a lift and things like that were more likely to be a barrier. And also then in terms of the type of physical activity that appealed to them, so they were more likely to do sports that were less resourceful and didn't require money to take part. If they didn't like it then, they could simply try something else instead of feeling that they were already invested in it. So once we had gained an understanding then of what was influencing their current physical activity, we then tried to gauge from this population what is it that we could do to help them become more active. And within this, four key themes emerged from our focus groups. These included providing them with the opportunity to try new activities, to increase the provision of activities within the school setting, and to incorporate both rewards and technology within interventions. So in terms of opportunities to try new activities, and this was a recurrent theme that emerged, particularly from those who we sampled who were least active, many highlighted that they needed something on offer that was a shift away from the traditional sports that were typically offered both in and outside of school. 
So you'll see from the quotes here, things to do with competency. Oh, you have to be good at a particular sport, and I don't feel I am. So it's about providing them with non-structured, non-competitive opportunities to be active. In addition, they also felt that the school environment had a key role to play here, and there were numerous benefits. Again, the, the constant theme that was coming through from social support was highlighted here. So obviously within the school setting, they had friends there that they were able to go along to these activities with, and that would be more likely to encourage their adherence. And in addition, they also highlighted then some of the knock-on benefits that being able to be active across the school day could have. So many of our girls highlighted that they were sitting in the classroom at lunchtime while the boys were out kicking a football around the playground and things. And they said if we were able to go out and do something at lunchtime, it would wake us up, perk us up for the afternoon. So from the focus group work that we conducted and from the wide um, range of evidence that there is to date, looking at physical activity promotion, it's key that the school environment has a key role to play here in promoting health-related behaviours. And the school environment is obviously particularly advantageous and that outside of the home, it's where our young people spend most of their time. And by promoting physical activity and other health behaviours within the school setting, we have the ability to overcome um, health inequalities because we're targeting all pupils at once. So moving forward from the qualitative work, we then designed an intervention that could be delivered within the school setting. And for this, we obviously had to try and come up with a type of activity then that would overcome the cited barriers. So we decided to develop a brisk walking intervention in schools. And walking has been frequently cited as the most natural form of physical activity. And when we think back to the barriers identified in our focus group work, Walking provided an activity that was convenient for our young people. It required no specialist skills, so it wasn't going to be team-based, structured, or competitive, or anything like that. And it's of little or no economic cost to the individual. So we developed what was known as the WISH study. So this was a peer-led brisk walking in schools intervention. And within this study, we recruited 200 adolescent females from six schools across Northern Ireland. We conducted a series of baseline measurements on these participants, so we would have objectively measured their physical activity and also collected data on other health outcomes such as BMI, blood pressure and fitness. We then assigned our participants to either take part in our 12-week intervention or to act as a control so that we could compare. And following completion of the 12-week intervention, we then repeated our measurements to be able to evaluate if there was any possible or potential influence of the intervention. So just to briefly highlight then some of the key components of the WISH study. So as I said previously, it was a 12-week school-based brisk walking programme where we provided young people with the opportunity to take part in 15-minute walks that were delivered across the school day. So these depended on the school day and were either delivered before class or at break and lunchtime. And the real novel aspect of this intervention was how we actually facilitated it within the school setting. So we trained older pupils within the schools, um, those in fifth year and above, to act as walk leaders. So this was to provide both social support for the individuals, but also to ensure um, that the walks were supervised, performed safely, and that they were at a moderate intensity. And in terms then of building components in from the participant point of view, we provided our participants with weekly reminders, and they were also given reward stamps for each walk completed that they could then exchange for small prizes. So some of the key findings then from our 12-week intervention. We found that the WISH study increased levels of light intensity physical activity across the school day by approximately eight minutes. And subsequently then, this coincided with a decrease in levels of sedentary behaviour. However, the intervention had no impact um, on levels of moderate to vigorous physical activity. So the WISH study demonstrated that a novel low-cost intervention was feasible within the school setting and had the potential to change health-related behaviours in the short term. So following completion of the intervention, we then completed some evaluation work with our participants to gain insight into their experience of being involved. And again, our participants reiterated the role that the school could play in helping them be more active. But they still identified challenges within the school day in trying to increase their activity. Many of our participants within the intervention felt that girls were disadvantaged when it came to the provision of extracurricular sporting options compared to the boys in school. 
and found that the, the WISH study then provided them with a convenient way of being active that allowed them to engage in activity with friends and still have social opportunities across break and lunch. So following on then from our focus group work and our intervention, um, where we had gained insight into um, what young people thought and the feasibility of the study, we then felt it was important to gain some insight from the actual perspective of the schools when it comes to promoting health-related behaviours. So when we think about it from a physical activity perspective, we traditionally think of the roles of schools as providing physical activity through structured, timetabled physical education. So within Northern Ireland, post-primary schools are recommended to provide at least two hours per week of timetable PE. However, data collected from Sport Northern Ireland indicated that just 9% of post-primary schools were meeting this provision. And worryingly then, the time allocated to physical education tended to decline as pupils moved through the year groups. So from this then, it's clear that we need to look at other non-traditional ways of promoting activity within school, namely through extracurricular activities. So we conducted um, an online survey with post-primary schools in Northern Ireland to gain an idea of what the current provision of extracurricular activities was and to gain insight from teachers and PE staff on the challenges faced and how they could move forward in providing um, other opportunities to be active. So our survey identified that it was usually specialist staff within school, like PE teachers, who were usually tasked with the delivery of extracurricular activity. And in some instances then, they were supported by non-specialist staff. In terms of the practicalities and the logistics of delivering this type of activity, they identified a number of key barriers including staffing constraints, time, and also interest from pupils. In terms of what the schools felt would encourage participation in extracurricular activities, similar to what our adolescents um, noted, they felt that friends taking part was going to be the strongest driver and the strongest motivator in getting young people involved. In terms then of the feasibility of implementing studies and trials such as the WISH study, the majority of our responding schools felt that walking would be an effective and suitable means of promoting activity within the school setting, but again practical concerns and issues were raised, particularly in relation to safety and supervision and also the suitability of the school environment. So it's important that when we're designing interventions we take into account these practical issues and considerations from schools. We also asked our school staff to identify what groups within the school environment they felt would benefit most from this type of intervention. And not surprisingly, schools themselves also identified girls as the key target population, and also those who were not perhaps defined as sporty pupils. So just to conclude and summarize then, within today's presentation, um, I've hopefully made the case um, for adolescent girls and the need to target um, key health-related behaviours in this population. Through the implementation and delivery of trials such as the WISH study, we have shown that such studies are feasible within the school environment and that they can have an influence on health behaviours in this population. And we know that if we can effectively influence behaviours at this stage of the life cycle, there is evidence to show then that this will track into adulthood. So just to conclude then with some recommendations, so we feel that there is a need to both support um, the implementation and the robust evaluation of interventions and initiatives to increase physical activity in this population, both through research, but also as we know, there is a lot of good work that already goes on in the community. So if we're able to actually robustly evaluate this as well, it will provide further evidence. In addition, given the strong role of peers and social support at this stage of the life cycle, we feel that there is merit as well in promoting physical activity through peer-led and social support structures. And also then, given the many-sided barriers to physical activity, continue to use walking as a means of promoting physical activity. I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>